of the lights? It's possible to turn them off? Good morning, everybody. Uh, we um, welcome to the session on marine world heritage. We have a pretty full agenda for this meeting, so uh, we're going to keep you very busy. And hopefully, at the end of the session, you have a pretty good idea of the power and the potential that lies in the World Heritage Convention, which this year celebrates its 40th anniversary for the conservation of special places in the ocean. I, uh, my name is Fanny Duvra, I'm the coordinator of the War Heritage Marine Program, which is based in Paris uh, at UNESCO. This session is uh, not so much to give you an idea of all the 46 marine sites that are currently inscribed on the War Heritage List. What we want to do with this session is more to focus on what you actually can do with the War Heritage Convention. There is a second, uh, more uh, interactive uh, session planned for this afternoon in the Blue Planet Pavilion, which is on uh, the third floor, and there you will get a full perspective on the various activities that the War Heritage Marine Program is engaged in, and you will also get to know where you can find information uh, about uh, those 46, what we call, crown jewels of the ocean. I will not talk for very long because we have several speakers to be to allow you to give a, a perspective both from uh, the site. Um, so we have a site manager, two site managers actually here that are from Marine World Heritage sites that are busy, you know, working day to day with the World Heritage Convention and can and will explain to you what it means to them and uh, how it has helped them to bring their local uh, co ocean conservation challenges up to something that is of international importance. So we uh, have two site managers here today. Um, then we also will have a presentation by um, someone from a uh, NGO, a major NGO, who will give you a perspective on uh, how the NGO community can use the World Heritage Convention to, to mainly focus the attention to some of the up to the conservation of some of the real essential issues in some of these uh, spectacular places. We also have someone uh, that has thought for many many years about how you uh, can do all of that in a very thoughtful way and how you actually can use the uh, World Heritage Convention to improve your management so we have someone uh, to do that as well. After those three presentations we will presentations we will have an interactive discussion of about an hour and there we would like to learn from you what uh, you think about world heritage in general uh, both bad good uh, negative possible positive we want to hear about that from you and then what marine world heritage means to you and what you think uh, we could do to make it uh, the best it possibly can be after that guided uh, interactive dis discussion will have a final presentation two final presentations one from uh, the agency that we just signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, i'll give you all the details and, and all the names uh, prior to the speakers that will be talking and finally we also have a person that will show you what uh, we are doing or what we're doing together to engage young people uh, into marine world heritage uh, and how we do that in, at a global stage. So I will give the word to our first speaker now, who is uh, Olani Wilhelm. She is the manager uh, of um, the site, the marine world heritage site that is inscribed both for its natural uh, phenomenon, for its spectacular beauty and biodiversity, but also for its cultural values. She is a site manager of Papa Hano Mokuakea, which is in uh, the United States and Hawaii, was inscribed in 2010. She will give you a presentation on how you can use the World Heritage Convention at, in a very powerful, very good, very positive way, but she, she will also uh, talk to you about how uh, her site has been helping another World Heritage site, which is uh, Phoenix Islands in Kiribati, and how a twinning arrangement is really inspiring now today the way forward for all 46 marine world heritage sites on the planet. So I'll give the word to um, Olani Wilhelm. Thank you. I suggest we put the lights up for the presentation. Aloha. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much to both Fanny and to Francois 
for inviting me to be part of this session and to all of you for your interest in being here. So as a whole, we're here today to talk about the, Marine, the, the World Heritage Convention and Marine World Heritage Program and how it's helping to, as Fanny says, protect these jewels of the ocean, e each of us sharing a different perspective. And as Fanny said, we're, this presentation is a little bit about the how, some, some practical steps of what does that mean, um, specific to partnerships. And so with that, I'd really want to emphasize that world heritage is a process. It's a process both before and after inscription. To be most successful, I believe, relationships are critical. They foster peer learning, exchange of best practice, synergies, and in best possible cases, shared investment across mutual needs and issues. And I think that that's why I was asked to present on this on one specific management tool that, for us, has already st strengthened how two sites, Popohanaumokuakea and the Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, participate and contribute, I believe, to the network, this growing network of Marine World Heritage Sites through our sister site agreement. So really, on behalf of the seven management agencies of Popohanaumokuakea, and my fellow manager from the Phoenix Islands who couldn't be here today, Tukubu Teroroko, I'm very honored to share this with you today. We actually signed our sister site agreement in 2009, specifically to assist each other in our respective journeys to seek world heritage status, which we achieved together in 2010. So although both relatively new to this world heritage family, the aspirations set forth by the convention really led both of our sites to independently seek this prestigious recognition. Although our reasons were not completely the same, these two very different countries, Hawaii as represented by the US and Kiribati, recognized the value of the con convention to our places in aiding our efforts to protect these very large and very remote ocean regions within our respective EEZs in turn adding value and diversity, we believe, to the list of inscribed sites. Increasing, I hope, the collective understanding of heritage values of the ocean globally. So I think before going into the sister site relationship, I think it's important to be a bit grounded in place so you understand these places that have come together. So first established as a coral reef ecosystem reserve in 2000, Popohanaumokuakea comprises the most remote three quarters of the most remote archipelago on Earth. At about 363,000 square kilometers, it's just a bit bigger than Germany. As with the Phoenix Islands, isolation has been a gift at a time when the world's oceans face serious decline, these coral reefs and ecosystems are among the healthiest, least disturbed, and most extensive left on the planet. Being subtropical, Popohanaumokuakea is at the very northern limit of coral growth. And according to our Kuulipo, or our predominant creation story, it's our eldest ancestor for us as Native Hawaiians. So I think it's quite interesting that Popohanaumokuakea is also the northernmost extent of Polynesian migration. So I focus on this for a minute because, as Fanny said, most people who know about Popohanaumokuakea know about our extraordinary natural heritage, but not about the sacredness of this place to us as Native Hawaiians and the rich cultural heritage. Really, given the lack of separation between nature and culture for us as Hawaiians, our management approach, therefore, deliberately focuses on incorporating science, culture, education, and community, not dissimilar to that in Kiribati. Given the lack of islands and atolls in North America, where we are um, politically attached, it's our management imperative, actually, in Hawaii to work regionally and internationally, forging partnerships with island nations who share similar challenges. We were inscribed as the first mixed natural and cultural heritage site in the U.S. and the first site on the list to be inscribed specifically for its cultural connections to the sea in this mixed capacity. In addition to being world heritage, just as an aside, we are also one of 13 particularly sensitive sea areas 
designated under the IMO. Oh, that was supposed to be the slide. Apologies. 50,000 square kilometers larger than Popohanaumokuakea, the Phoenix Islands are located in the Central Pacific, just south, five degrees of the equator. These islands and waters represent the Earth's last intact oceanic coral ecosystem and is the first marine protected area in the region to include large areas of deep water habitats. Because the deep sea is mostly unexplored, protecting it also safeguards many species that have yet to be studied and even discovered. It also serves as an added buffer against the global changes that are happening worldwide. So through its pioneering work, the Phoenix Islands is helping to lead the oceanic island nations of the South Pacific, providing unique approaches to deep water management, working with international partners in critical management areas like enforcement, and provides a real life example and I hope and believe inspiration for other small island developing states that such bold ocean governance is possible. As I mentioned, our sister site agreement predated both of our inscriptions and that may be different for other sites thinking of creating them, but the most important process of building relationships should not. In fact, for me, it's likely the most important ingredient for success. The inspiration for establishing a sister site relationship really began when Popohana Mokuakea co-sponsored a regional forum with UNESCO which the, um, to, because we were considering world heritage and we brought the countries, 20 countries in the Pacific together in 2007 in a forum called Our Sea of Islands. It's the first time I met fellow manager Tukubu and one of his strongest NGO partners, Sue Ta'e, who will share the stage here in a minute. It was really Sue who prodded us to think about formalizing an agreement under the existing treaty of friendship between the US and Kiribati, which honestly, I didn't even know existed. What was important here, I think, was that we facilitated an agreement using an existing mechanism, adding a very easy and positive win for both countries. And I think most importantly, as is the Pacific way, we informally worked together building trust both between and among managers and our partners, building the foundation and the framework for what was to come two years prior to even signing an agreement. So that relationship building, it, if you want that agreement to be meaningful, it's really important that you build trust over time. So, the agreement. Signed in 2009 and more formally known as a proposal for cooperative exchange falls under Article 5. And while this is specific to the US and Kiribati, I just wanted to point out that the language used says to use their best efforts to encourage cooperation between two countries in protecting the unique natural and cultural resources for their mutual benefit, to encourage and facilitate scientific research and cultural exchange. Who knew, except maybe Sue, that 30 years ago, these signatories of the treaty were gonna, had written this. And, you know, unfortunately it took us 30 years to get there, but this was the kind of thinking going on 30 years ago, and I would think many countries have things in and agreements like this that maybe have been forgotten over the decades and worth looking to see if these exist that can once again be built upon. The agreement's purpose was to establish a working relationship and outline both the intent and potential areas where we could cooperate. So we really identified these five areas here. One was about scale and what does that mean for, for biodiversity, focused again on world heritage, attaining world heritage listing. The second was about impacts. The third, on the remote aspect of archipelagic management and of course, the role of culture and community. We developed a three-year work plan and identified really discrete practical strategies under three specific objectives. Strengthen bonds, facilitate communication, and encourage sharing. People go, how does that reach resource management? Well, without those things, I say you have no hope without talking about the people who it takes to build these relationships to work on these daunting challenges. 
As the work plan requires, we annually review our progress, starting with the first examination last December. We reflected, and in just one year, we achieved a number of things. One year. We both became World Heritage Sites. We collaborated on Phoenix Island's research vision. We conducted joint outreach internationally and regionally, and we co-hosted a marine think tank to develop a shared research agenda. But I think most importantly, within just one year as sister sites, we founded Big Ocean, a network of the world's large-scale marine managed areas, including the Great Barrier Reef Marine Protected Area and Heritage Site, who's really our early pioneer in this world of marine world heritage. The network was founded by managers for managers to help build this rapidly growing new genre of marine conservation. And while not entirely focused on marine world heritage, many of the objectives and activities of the network directly relate to the same as those of the World Heritage Convention. As I would argue, all of our big ocean sites right now could easily make, meet the strict requirements of outstanding universal value under the convention. These sites, mostly in remote areas, are perfect companions to these 46 jewels of the ocean that are part of our marine world heritage family. Learning from this relationship is aiding in establishing relationships with other areas. The request has been made to assist the Marquesas in developing its world heritage application for both inscription and also possible MPA establishment under a different bilateral agreement that NOAA, my agency, has with the French MPA agency to work within French Polynesia. Both the Phoenix Islands and Popohanaumokuakea have valuable experiences to share with our southern cousins, perhaps adding a sibling to the growing family of large-scale marine heritage sites. <laughs>